Can you hear me, Mike? I don't think so. You can. I don't think he can. He's our master of ceremonies, so. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Can you hear, Mike, can you hear uh, me? My audio. Yeah, I got a weird thing going on. My audio is coming out of my computer, but it's gonna be fine. Headphones. Who needs them? <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome to the first Creative Mornings of 2021. Here we are. Um, as always, uh, we kick things off with an icebreaker. So you should have received an email with the icebreaker, but I'll also post it in the chat so everybody knows what we're talking about as they come in this morning. Uh, so today, hold on. Today, our icebreaker, what fictional family would you most like to join? And let me tell you, this one stumped me. I don't have a great answer here, but I'd love to hear yours. Who wants to go first? I was the bank family from the Fresh Prince. That's a good one. Yes. Yes. Quick, quick. <laughs> is it for the house? Is it for the butler? Is it for, like, what are we, what? All of the above. The family values? <laughs> the family mainly? values, of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That's great. Um, I think it's That's so fun. good. To anyone who knows me, Josh Mosley is on this call, is going to crack up, but I want to be Coach and Tammy Taylor's daughter because I love Friday Night Live. Who doesn't want to be Coach Taylor's daughter? He's the best. Also, Julie Taylor's the worst. So if I could just replace her. <laughs> the worst. <laughs> He's so Passion. I like it. Worst. She's so angsty and ugh. Like we all are at that age, but I can't, can't feel. Hey, that's, that's family though. It feels like you are part of the family. You already have like an emotional attachment to it. Yeah. So yeah. some might say you already are. Yeah. Good. Good. That's healthy. <laughs> <laughs> I kept thinking about the proud family. I don't know if anybody watched that cartoon growing up. I don't know why I can't move on from it. I can't think of any other family. Uh, but so yeah, I guess that's my answer. Fictional families. Who's got one? I would really love to be part of the Nope Wyatt family, like from Parks and Rec. I just think that it would be so fun. <laughs> <laughs> Don't they have great they, answer? Is it twins that they have? Triplets. Yeah. Oh. That's right. I mean, something wild. Yeah. To be one of those. Oh, really? I don't think I ever caught that. Or like, was that towards the end or something? Yeah. Well, you never saw them on camera. <laughs> you always heard about like the hell they would raise off camera. Like, and you never, but you never saw the kids. You just heard about them. <laughs> That's a great answer. It was like a time jump too. So like she was yeah. pregnant and then like five years later they picked up. If you, sorry, if you've never seen the end of Parks and Rec, we just spoiled all that for you, but that's been <laughs> off the air for like five years now. So that's really on. <laughs> I think I would say maybe Gilmore Girls because it's really far from perfect, but really wholesome. It's also, I've, I'm only now watching it for the first time. And it was like, the perfect uh, thing to do during quarantine. Yeah, and it, isn't it, wouldn't it be great to just have like a Kirk in your family, like just in your town to like <laughs> call Yeah, be. <laughs> um, also everyone, this is Lisa from our um, HQ team. So Lisa's joining us today just to check out our event. So. Hey everyone, thanks for having me. Of course. Yeah, so I posted the question in the chat. We're talking about the fictional family that you'd most like to join. Mainly, mainly TV shows so far. Um, you know, we could. I mean, any anything fictional. What do you What do you got? Who's up? Um, uh, 
Oh, I was going to say maybe not fictional family, but I know that's the question. But if I could pick like a real life family, I would want to be the Obamas. I just want to say that out loud. Just right. everyone can feel my energy and then we can move on. They're fictional to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, real. Well, if we're going with real families, the Obamas or the Washingtons with uh, Denzel and John David, I oh. think like, That'd be a dope Ooh, family. That's in a powerhouse. Of, in terms of fictional families, uh, I spent the entire Christmas break running through Fresh Prince, so Diamond just copped my uh, copped my choice. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to go a little off the beaten path. Uh, the Sopranos for the family and the capital F family. You know, get that mob life. Feel me? Wow. Dangerous. Yeah. That's a dangerous choice. Yeah. I like it though. I just finished yeah. The Sopranos. That was my that was my first quarantine show. I'd never watched it before. It's pretty um, great. Yeah. So we've had a couple more people join. Oh, we got some in the comp. Oh, the thorn bear. <laughs> oh, Francis in the comments. The thornberries. Yes. Oh my god, that's amazing. I mean, she just travels the world and talks to animals. Like, there's nothing better than that, I don't think. <laughs> there isn't. There isn't. You're so right. There is nothing better than that. The thornberries. Oh, my gosh. Great answer. Also, Fran, that feels like you because Fran likes to travel the world, and I'm pretty sure Fran talks to cats. So I, I mean, I, I talk to any sort of animal. It doesn't matter if they can understand me or not. It tracks. Yeah. <laughs> Could they all talk to animals or just the little girl? I think it was just Eliza. I don't okay. think you're in the Oh, man. That's good. The Thornberries. I need to find that. I need to find that show. Who else wants to share their fictional family that they want to join? I'll share. I don't know that it's... Um necessarily somebody I want to join or just that I feel like my own personal life as a mom of three kids sort of mirrors um but like the Dunphys from Modern Family I feel like some of those things happen in my house and so <laughs> um like really Modern Family as a whole I would love any of them to be in my circle um but when you were talking about other families not fictional families I'm a huge Chrissy Teigen John Legend insta follower so i'm if they ever have family openings i'm there i'll be applying <laughs> you're speaking diamond's language she's like <laughs> <laughs> to be in that family. yeah john and that uh he performed at that that thing um inauguration night it was like whoo i know johnny <laughs> yeah that was great that was great the dunphys Another great family. Man, you guys came to play today. The Dunphys. Wow. I'll go. Uh, I'd like to be a part of the Rose family. Ooh. Uh. Oh, that's a good one. Good one. But like pre, pre broke? Yeah, really? like, po like post the moving to the to Schitt's Creek. Yes. There you go. Yeah, that's like the that spirit, camp. Craig. That's the spirit. I should have like worn my icon. I have an icon sweatshirt. I should have worn that. I'd like to add on to that that um, if I had a white mother, I wanted to be Catherine O'Hara just because she seems pretty awesome. <laughs> she just seems like a weirdo, but like in the best way. So yeah, if I ever had if I ever had a white mother, the one I want to be Catherine O'Hara. She seems awesome. Yeah, I listened to it, Josh. She was on Mark Maron's podcast a couple of weeks ago. Really, Mark Maron and. She said everyone in her immediate family is funny. Talking about like her dad's funny, her siblings are funny, and like how everyone in the family is just a really funny person. So it would be kind of a an exciting family to be a part of. I gotta download that because she they did the she and Eugene Levy did the Conan podcast like a year ago, and they were hilarious on that. I never realized that she was Sally from Nightmare Before Christmas. Oh yeah. I was with my little brother is 20 years younger than me. So he's a teenager and we were watching home alone over Christmas. And he was like, wait, 
is that the mom is that moira from schitt's creek like he couldn't he didn't re he's so young like he didn't realize like she's not dead she's still acting <laughs> He's so old to him, but he, it like blew his mind that it was the same person. You gotta show him Beetlejuice. Yeah. yeah, her character in Beetlejuice is my favorite. Well, honestly, Moira is like an elevated version of her character in Beetlejuice. It's like the same eccentricity that. That's that true. Yeah, very true. It's, she's Delia, right? Delia Deeks is her name in that one. Mm -hmm. Keep forgetting her kids at the airport. Come on, y'all. Don't don't <laughs> parade this woman around. <laughs> um, how about our host, Kelsey? You and your husband. Do you guys have a fictional family that you'd love to be a part of? Well, of course, we are like, what book characters are we? Yeah, like sure. yeah. yeah. We uh, our our very first uh, creative mornings. The question was like, which fictional character would you like to be? And a lot of people had book characters. So, but yeah, feel free to jump book, TV, movie, wherever you'd like to go. Um. Well, I w our kids watch Craig of the Creek. That's like their favorite cartoon right now. Which, you, if you guys have not seen that, it's fabulous. So I would say that I would love to be a part of their family because they're hilarious or even just one of the kids who like hang out in the the creek area behind all the houses like they're super awesome. Um, and then in terms of books, I was just thinking like, like we loved Kill a Mockingbird, but like, I don't really want to, you know, like that's not really where I want to live my <laughs> no, life. In like Jim, like Jim Crow um, Alabama. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like it's cool. Um, but I think like, I love the boxcar children. Did you guys ever read yeah. that? If you haven't, it's such a good read, even like as an adult. And so I love, I love the idea of being in a boxcar and having like broken dishes that you find and you have to eat off of and like making shelves out of random stuff you find. Like yeah. that's totally my jam. So I think probably I want to hang out with watch the dog and those kids and, you know, find spoons in a trash heap that I clean. I don't know. Things like that. <laughs> Uh, I was thinking the March family from Little Women. Yeah. Just because they have so much fun. They're always like putting on their own plays and writing stories together and they seem to have a lot of fun. So yeah. Oh. I, I, I like their house. That's a, the March sisters. I would love to be one of those. So yeah. that's a good answer. Maybe the, the long lost March brother or something. Yeah. You can be a March sister. Who knows? You can just be Laurie, you know. <laughs> that works too. That's great. Who else wants to share? Oh, the Weasleys. Did you see that in the chat, Mike? That's a good one, too. Oh, the Weasley family. <laughs> they just, like, adopt Harry, and they have such, like, a familial love. I'm... Their their home is so, it just seems so warm. And, yeah, welcoming. It's like, that's a good place to wake up, you know? You know those good places that you wake up, you're just like, oh, yes, I'm here. Yeah, definitely the Weasley house. That's a good one. All right, we, Mike, you got two more minutes before we run through announcements. Yeah, this is your last chance, everybody. I Fictional have... family. We also are doing real families. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't, this isn't a family, but I would like to just live in the new girl loft. Uh, <laughs> I think that would be pretty rad. But like, whose room would you want to live in in that place? <laughs> Jess's, Jess's, Jess's. <laughs> only i i think i wouldn't mind schmidt's room i don't want him in there but i feel like <laughs> he's very neat and tight so his room would be clean it is i mean it seems like he would be doing all the cleaning all the time so that's cool with me <laughs> they're constant like pranks there right isn't i haven't seen that show much but i feel like it's they're constantly pranking one another oh, constant pranks and mischief and hijinks and <laughs> and you're you're here for that huh yeah i love it <laughs> That's great. <laughs> All right, last second. Final countdown. Who's got it? Come on, let it off your chest. It's Friday morning. It's exciting. Did anyone say Swiss Family Robinson yet? No, that's a good one. I would, similar to Laura, I don't really know so much about the story. I don't want to be like chased by tigers or pirates, <laughs> but the treehouse element of like the lifestyle, I would love to live there for just a couple weeks. Test it out, maybe forever. That's great. 
That feels like you, Sarah, living in a tree. That tracks. <laughs> Sarah mm. loves the outdoors. She's from like a very outdoors place in Michigan. And it just, that feels right for you. I love that. Yeah, that's great. That's great. <laughs> I liked the answers that were just like relating to like where they're located or like the things you would obtain or like be able to live in a tree or something like that. I never, see, I never even thought, y'all are so creative, man. Creative mornings, here we are. <laughs> Mike, everyone is creative. Everyone's creative. Yeah, I know, obviously, <laughs> these answers. It's good yeah. stuff. Including I also feel like Sarah would want to be a part of the Corleone family. <laughs> oh my gosh, Josh. Yeah. I didn't even think about that. Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. Just I not up until Godfather 3, because we talked about this. Yeah. And That's that part of it. Yeah. One and two, for sure. I don't know if I'd want to be a Corleone. I mean, he kind of offs siblings. He doesn't really like all that much. Yeah, it's, that's play by the rules. Yeah. Yeah, but maybe I could like, try to like connect everybody. And then we'd all be one big happy family again. Oh, she's going to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> but still Mike, be down and dirty. Mike, if you want to wrap it up and give one last call, and then we'll run into slides, and then I'll hand it off to Yeah, you. this is it, team. This is it. Anybody else? I think we're good. Lindsay, if you want to take over. Sure, yeah. Thanks, everybody, for being here. We're going to run through um, our slide deck this morning. Um, and then after that, I'm going to hand it off to Carrie to introduce our speakers for this morning. So we're really excited to have Kelsey and Joe with us from Yellow Dog Bookshop. Um, so obviously, we're at Creative Mornings. Um, this next slide here has our um, local like social channels on it. So if you're not a not privy to any of these, please feel free to sign up and follow us. This is where you're going to find all the information on future events and anything happening in the Creative Mornings universe. Um, Additionally, what we're going to do is go through um, some sponsor slides. So for those of you who are new to Creative Mornings, we have a global headquarter team. Lisa from that team is with us today. Um, and so that team, along with our global sponsors, help these events to happen and make them free of charge for anyone who wants to attend. So our newest sponsor is Skillshare. So Skillshare is an online learning community helping millions take the next step in their creative journey. So Skillshare is our newest global partner, and we're really excited to welcome them to the family this month. Um, Skillshare has extended their generous month-long offering of one month free on a new Skillshare premium account for all attendees of Creative Mornings. Um, so I am going to pop at the end of this presentation, I'm going to go ahead and pop some of those links in the chat so you can check those opportunities out along the way. So if you want to learn more about Skillshare, I'll throw that link in there. And if you want to take advantage of that opportunity, please feel free to do so. Um, our next global sponsor is MailChimp. So thank you to MailChimp. They're our Creative Mornings official global partner for marketing. Um, as our amazing theme partner for this month, they also have some really exciting news to share. So MailChimp's partner program, MailChimp & Co., is super easy to join as a freelancer or agency at any level that you're at. And they teach you how to level up your business. So if you are using MailChimp for your business um, or clients, you're going to want to check out this opportunity. I also just happen to really love this visual. All the bright colors and um, so the branding is really great so if you're interested in checking this out I'll also have the link in the chat for you um, after we go through these announcements. Um, our last global sponsor is Basecamp. So thank you to Basecamp. They're our global partner for project management and to their groundbreaking new email platform, Hey. So this is really fun. They're new, well, I guess it's not new any longer, but they have a literal dumpster fire. I mean, I think we can all agree that 2020 was a dumpster fire and a half, but they've got this fun um, interactive way for you to like send any emails through this email account if you want to literally watch them burn. So if you got bad news this year, say you got your COVID positive results that email, let's throw that in the dumpster fire. Anything that kind of did not go your way in 2020, which feels like most things did not go our way in 2020, um, they just have this really fun interactive way to throw your emails into the actual fire and to watch them burn. So you can submit your emails um, through the link that I'm going to throw in the chat. But also make sure to check out the live stream. <laughs> this says it turns out the soundtrack to the dumpster fire is the perfect background music for working from home. So I just thought this would be a fun um, interactive thing to do. I actually plan on sending a few emails to this later today. <laughs> 
Um, and then we also have field virtual field trips. So um, field trips are workshops and gatherings that are hosted by people just like you throughout our global community. And you can sign up to participate or if you have something that you're really good at and you wanna share that and be willing to teach it to a Zoom room full of participants, um, that would be a really great idea for you to do a field trip. I know that Mike and several other local Columbia folks have checked out these field trips. Um, they're super fun if you haven't gotten a chance to do those yet. They're always free to you and the cool thing about everything being virtual these days is that I could check out what's happening in Barcelona and check out a field trip there or one in Seattle. Um, so I just think that's a really cool opportunity if you're just looking for ways to fill the time. I know we're all at home a lot more these days. Um, and I also just love this slide, the creative mornings by the numbers, because it reminds me that we're not alone and that we're all doing these virtual events together and that there are creative people all over the world and that we're part of this really large global community of folks just learning from one another. Um, so the um, stats here, I just think are really staggering and exciting. So if you're um, feeling a little lonely or feeling like you're kind of venturing out into this 2021 alone, just remember that there are people meeting virtually all over the world and I just think it's cool that we're, we get to be a part of that. Um, before I kick it over to um, Carrie to introduce our speakers this morning, I did want to give um, Lauren, our team member, the opportunity to read the Creative Mornings Manifesto. We like to read this at every gathering just to remind everyone of why we're here and um, uh, why we're doing what we're doing. So Lauren, if you wouldn't mind reading the manifesto for us and then we'll get on to our speakers. Sure, thank you. Everyone is creative. A creative life requires bravery and action, honesty and hard work. We are here to support you, celebrate with you, and encourage you to make the things you love. We believe in the power of community. We believe in giving a damn. We believe in face-to-face -face connections, in learning from others, in hugs and high fives. We bring together people who are driven by passion and purpose, confident that they will inspire one another and inspire change in neighborhoods and cities around the world. Everyone is welcome. Thanks, Lauren. And just as a um, reminder, I know this face-to-face -face connections is really hard in this day and time, and I'm really excited about the possibility at some point of us doing in-person gatherings again. Until then, having face-to-face -face over Zoom will have to suffice, so we're really excited that you made the time to be here this morning. Um, I know that it can be a little fatiguing to be on Zoom a lot, but we're just excited that you're here and hope that this is life-giving to you. Um, so before I hand it off to Carrie to introduce our this month's theme is promise. So promises that are made and kept are exchanges of power. Um, our Tirana chapter chose this month's exploration of promise and the talented, I hope I'm going to get this name correct, Jolyn Matraku illustrated this um, particular theme. And so as a reminder to all of you, every one of our um, Creative Mornings chapters gets to select a theme throughout um, the coming months and years. And so at one point we will have our chance to choose a theme, but I love the idea that a local artist and chapter of Creative Mornings gets to choose the theme every so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop to share, hand it off to Carrie, if you wouldn't mind introducing our speakers for today, and then we'll um, get to hear from Kelsey and Joe. Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. Promise. In promise, there is hope, something good, something unknown, but optimistic. The promise of a new year, the promise of a new idea. You don't have to look farther than Amanda Gorman's beautiful reading of her poem, The Hill We Climb, at the inauguration this week to see the promise that words can give us. As she said, somehow we weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. For this month's theme of promise, we found speakers who know the promise of words, the promise of, a, of an unopened book, the promise of an idea seeded, growing at just the right time. This month, we're excited to hear from Joe and Kelsey, the husband and wife team behind Yellow Dog Bookshop in downtown Columbia. The pair moved here in 2006 and saw their dream of owning a bookstore manifest in 2013 when they purchased the location on Knight Street. Their passion for creative ideas and the promise of a little bookshop named after a sweet lab mix are the perfect way to kick off uh, this year's Creative Morning. So thank you, Joe and Kelsey, for joining us this morning. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have a little slideshow that's not very impressive, but our story, you know, I'm pretty funny. So usually we can charm people that way. Um, so if you would like to see it, I can try to share that with you. 
Um, is there a share screen? Yeah. Yeah, nice. there's a share screen option at the bottom if you want to give that a try. There you go. Awesome. It's like I've almost got the hang of this whole Zoom stuff, except do I know how to use slides? That's the next question. Do, 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 this guy. Yes. The promise of never having to wear a tie. Actually, maybe we'll just, well, it's fine. Um, okay, so <laughs> when we were thinking about promise, you know, both of us are huge readers and we, um, there is definitely that excitement about opening a new book. We just went on this thing that we, we dubbed the, the nap read. This is something that we have come up with, which is nap slash read, where we go away for about 20, hopefully 24 hours, no kids, no animals, nobody else, um, just books and junk food and either like a hotel room or an Airbnb or some place where we can be completely secluded, just ourselves to read books. No funny business, nothing, no married stuff, if you know what I mean, or not married, whatever you do, you do, or whatever. Um, but we just read books. Like it's the most fantastic nerdy thing that you can possibly do. So, um, we just went on one of those and it was like transformative. It was so great to sort of get back into reading for reading, because I think that we do a lot of reading now to kind of catch up with the books that we need to be reading, or even just like in the five minutes we have between all the other things that we're doing. So um, that made me feel sort of this idea of promise of like, okay, I'm promising myself I'm going to read more because it fills me with actual joy, which is the thing that I kind of forget sometimes. So, um, also, I tend to talk, Joe's a little more quiet than I am, so we'll see how this goes. <laughs> um, I will share, I promise. Okay. Um, so keep this never having to wear a tie thing in mind. I want to actually go to, how do I get back to just the slides where we're looking at like this? Let's do that. Is that okay? Good enough? Can you guys see it well enough that way? Or do you want it to be bigger? And if you Sorry, don't. a little bigger would be great. Okay, do you want to go back to this way? It just cuts off. Yeah. Already. Okay, got it. Um, okay, so just a little, you've already said a lot about us, so, um, but we have two small kids who we also call our book, our smallest booksellers. Um, Sally is 12, and Boo, his name is Atticus, but he goes by Boo, which is like one of those funny, hilarious stories that will take forever, so I'll tell it later maybe, but um essentially his sister calls him boo so he never wants to be called by anything else because she's the best thing in his life so um and then we just wanted to share our favorite books in case you guys want to write those down and take a look sometime um you want to go first yeah if, um I, I get asked this question a lot because we have the j school people come up the street and yep. interview us all the time and one of the questions they often ask is what's your favorite book and so uh, what I usually say, and it kind of changes from day to day because sometimes it's the last book I read that I'm really into. Mm -hmm. um, like what I read, um, oh, uh, Who Fears Death by Nenio Korafor. Suddenly I was like all into that and recommending it to everyone. Uh, but if I have to pick one that I always go back to, it's Lord of the Rings by Tolkien. Yeah. Like, he's not kidding. Like, he, like I'll just walk into the room and he's like, Oh, I'm just reading this chapter again for the thousandth time. It's pretty great. Um, and I have two favorites. One is um, The Speed of Light by Elizabeth Rosner. And uh, not many people have read that. That's not like a, it hasn't gotten tons of awards or something like that, but it's beautiful. And then the other one is um, Possession by A.S. Byatt, which sounds like it's going to be some kind of like really awesome like horror book or something. But um, it's actually kind of a really dense, a uh, historic fiction book where it has like a modern story and historic story and there's you know a little bit of a love story but then there's also this like academic pursuit and trying to find out who wrote these poems and that kind of thing so um possession by a.s by it and speed of light by elizabeth rosner and the lord of the rings by tolkien you might have heard of that one before so um yeah so those are kind of our favorite books what oh this slide's really good pause for a sec. So we, um, you know, the whole reason why we are doing what we do is because we love to read. Like that's absolutely the number one reason why, but um, we have some other things that influenced us too. So, so this is how you know that you're going to be married to a person forever when your high school senior portraits look almost the same. <laughs> so this is us when we were younger. 
if you can't tell. And um, so we just wanted to kind of talk about sort of how our business um, came together and why we ended up like starting our own business. It wasn't something necessarily that we thought about our whole lives. So um, when I was younger, I didn't really know what I wanted to be when I grew up. I kind of was like, well, I guess my mom's a secretary because that's at the time what that was called. I guess I'll be a secretary and well, I like to, you know, play cards with my grandparents. So maybe I'll be a card dealer like in Vegas. Like that'd be cool. Oh, but maybe I'll be a bartender. Cause like as a kid, I'd like to help them make their drinks, you know, when I was like, this is fine. It's totally normal parenting. It's fine. Um, so those are kind of the things that I was like, I don't know, basically I just want to like talk to people. Like those are the jobs that I wanted to do was to be around people. Um, and you? Yeah, uh, most of mine uh, involved books, but from a different angle. Um... I either, when I was 10, I wanted to be a writer. And then later when I was in high school, I, I was kind of settled on teaching. Like I wanted to be an English teacher, either at the college or high school level. Yeah. When I first met Joe's family, they were, they all like talked to me about how when he was a kid, everyone called him the professor. Like that was the thing that they all like referred to him as because he was always had his nose in a book. So, um, so I think that when you think about what you want to be when you are younger, you look to the sort of icons, right, that you see around yourself. So it could be from the Richard Scarry book that has like all of the different like animals that wearing the different outfits for the different professions that they want to be or that they that you can be. And those are the pictures you have in your head. Um, I think, you know, now we have like more TV shows and, and a lot more media out there that like tell us other jobs that you can have in your life. But when we were growing up, it was kind of like, well, teacher, doctor, lawyer, you know, these sort of basic, not basic jobs, but you know, like um, sort of types of jobs and I never really thought about owning my own business as being a job that I could do I certainly didn't know I think at the time like what I would what I could possibly do um so we met in 2000, 2001 2001 because he's old and um in California which is where I grew up and I was um there I was working at this bookstore Kepler's Books in Menlo Park after finishing college and moved back home to live with my mom because yes that's what you do and um and then yeah i met joe a couple of years later um because you had been kind of bouncing around yeah i had worked there previously for a few years and then left and was coming back to california and wanted to work at the bookstore there again yeah and so joe grew up in the midwest um in illinois and actually went to mizzou for his for grad school um, and then took a break and came back out to California. So we kind of like, you know, he went to college at Stanford right across the street from where I went to high school. We were there at the same time. We didn't know. Anybody. But um, we kind of like missed each other a couple of times in, in you know, at that, in that time frame. So we actually met each other um, right around here, just past this guy with the blue hat <laughs> in this uh, picture you can see. Um, and I thought he was weird and he thought that I was uh, cute and obviously a little snarky or sassy or something. Snarky is perfectly fine. Sassy, definitely. Um, but yeah, I thought he was a little strange and I was right and it's great. So, um, <laughs> but we, uh, connected, you know, obviously in our interest in books. And so I have this picture of the Gashley Crumb Tinies, which is a, um, story. That's what this drawing is down here. It's a story by Edward Gorey about. Well, it's it's basically an alphabet rhyme. Yeah. Which involves uh, twenty six uh, strange and sometimes grisly ways of children meeting their deaths. Yeah, about children dying. It's yeah. not. It's like you know. It's like macabre, right? Like it's sort of okay. It's sort of jokey, funny. Huh. Um, this is where we veer into the strange. But anyway, so uh, the 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 funny story about us is that when <laughs> when I was setting up a Halloween display. I was putting these books onto this Halloween display and I said, looked over to where Joe was standing with another person and said, whoever can repeat this whole poem, I will marry you because this is like my favorite thing. And so then Joe was like, hi, A is for this and yeah, A is for Amy who fell down the stairs, B is for Basil assaulted by bears and yes, so on. And so on. And so I was like, okay, that's, you're weird. And then we kind of like decided we liked each other. So, um, so yeah, so our, our meet cute is like, adorably cute I know it's gross but we just I don't know we just really like each other's brains and are strange and so <laughs> it kind of works so at Kepler's um the real the real point we're all here for is um what did we learn right while we were there so um we learned a lot about customer service 
Um, you want to talk about what your job was there? Oh, I, I had lots of jobs. Yeah, you did. Um, yeah, I worked on the floor as a bookseller. I became a, a shift leader really early. Um, became a, one of the cash reconciliation people really early because they're like, wow, he learned the register really quick. He doesn't make mistakes. Um, I started training people. Um, became an assistant manager. I was the personal manager for a while. Then I was in ordering as the ordering system manager. So I kind of worked all over yeah. and helped with returns and receiving a little bit. And, and I mostly focused on, I did customer service and the floor stuff, and then I moved into ordering as well, but I also was involved with all of the creative stuff. So setting up window displays and um, kind of like the look of what the store would look like at the different times of the season and that kind of thing. So, um, so we both, you know, worked with tons and tons of the customers. And the, the coolest thing about that is in a bookstore, your customers are there because they love the same things that you love. You know, like people who work in bookstores don't work there because you don't find many people who work in a bookstore who don't love books. Like you just, that's just not the place because you don't get paid well, you know, like it's not like the big bucks. Um, so you generally find people who are like you and nerdy and want to talk about, you know, their favorite character or their favorite fictional family to live with or whatever. Um, so I think that we learned a lot about how to connect with people and, um, finding that commonality between people, even if you have a different, uh, belief system or, um, you know, you come from different backgrounds or, or whatever the, the situation is that there are points where you can connect with people and that that kind of is the place to start a relationship or a commonality. So, um, you know, we've had lots of uh, <laughs> bad customers that we've had to deal with throwing people out. Winona Ryder once came into our store high as a kite and we had to like take the books out of her hands and bring them back to the store because she just kind of wandered away with them. Like, you know, all sorts of like funny stories like that that have happened over the years. Um, but I think what it did was it really solidified with us how to talk to people and, um, I don't know, just how to be, I, just how to connect. I don't know. I don't know a better word for it really. Yeah. yeah. And, and we, and, uh, we realized how special that customer community for books was Yeah, that it wasn't just about, I'd like to buy this thing but it was about sharing the experience of reading the book and, and talking about the book with, with someone who also read it right. and loved it. Right. And I think the, the, the other thing too, is that we really found our people while we were there. So, um, you know, like I have tattoos and I'm, you know, like a large lady and I'm loving it. And, um, you know, Joe is like happiest in a hoodie and like, you know, cargo pants, like <laughs> we're still dressing like we live in the nineties cause that's where we come from. Um, which comes around every now and again, which is nice. But, uh, I think that we very much feel like, um, we found people who were like us, like they wanted to come up with creative problem solving. Well, our time at Kepler's was also when Amazon really like came onto the scene. So if you've ever heard of Amazon, I don't know. Um, but Amazon puts small businesses out of business all the time because they are bastards. So like if, if uh, we learned the hard way how to deal with Amazon, you know, like we learned marketing, we learned um, if one customer walks away angry, that's going to influence 10 people. And back in the day, it was word of mouth because social media didn't exist. We know so much more now that like one person has a bad experience that influences them and all of their people like, whoa, like businesses go out of business because people have a really bad experience. So customer service and being good to your community and providing what they need and listening to them and responding to what they, um, what their needs are, I think is the number one thing that we really try to do, you know? So we've always kind of, I don't wanna say push the agenda, but we really believe in, um, the power of, of storytelling and, and understanding where people come from through that, that uh, reading of their stories. And so, you know, with Black Lives Matter and with, um, you know, especially like Asian authors, I feel like are not read as much here. Like that's what I've noticed, yeah, but also Asian I grew up in the Bay area. So I don't know, maybe my, I'm also kind of have a different like set of influences maybe, but there's a lot of books that we keep in stock that we have kept in stock since we opened because we believe in the, those authors and their stories and we want to make sure that people have access to their experiences because that's how we're going to understand other people you know like we're going to have conversations with people in the room next to us but if you don't have access or you don't know somebody who has a different experience than you which is you know that's true for so many people 
then reading someone else's story is going to help. And whether that's fictional or not, there's always a truth in there somewhere, right? So um, I think that that's something that we learned while we were there too, is, is really like getting to meet authors and, and hearing them talk about their work and why they became writers and all that kind of stuff. Um, that was really, really influential for us. So, um, and just on the slide, those are our two children at Kepler's back, you know, like obviously much later. Um, okay, so then the next question we always get is how did we get to Missouri? Because I'm from California and everyone's like, well, why didn't you just stay there? Because it's great and it is great, but it also is hella expensive. So like we, you know, I can't afford, we have a house there, we can't afford to live in it. So, um, so Joe was, went back to his uh when, Yeah, I came back degree. to my grad school program. I had chosen Mizzou originally because, well, two reasons. Their English program is really, really good. Like, they have excellent, excellent faculty and they're supportive of the students. And then also, um, I, my grandparents lived here in Columbia and my, my grandfather was the principal at Hickman like 50 years ago and, and he died in the 60s, but my grandmother lived here up until 1990. So I visited Columbia all the time as a kid and knew it was a, a nice little town. Yeah. And of course, I was like, where's Missouri? Because <laughs> Californians are jerks and we don't know anything. So, um, so when I kind of figured it out, I'm still figuring out all the states that we touch. But um, I, I really love this. I love this community. I love this place. I mean, it's so beautiful. And I miss the ocean every day. So don't get me wrong. But, um, but I love that it's, there's so much nature here. People love to go out and to do all sorts of things. So um, that to me is like the best. And then um, I just we put in this picture of our dog Scout. You can see her little tiny face next to Joe in the chair there. Um, she is who we named the bookshop after. She's our yellow dog. She's our first baby, and um, she passed away a couple years ago. So if we start crying right now, that is why. But um, she was just the best dog ever, like just ever. So we practiced on her before we had children, and you know, fairly successful at that. I think yeah. I don't know. Okay, so um, one day we were. Uh, getting Sparky's ice cream, which you can see. And we walked across the street because we saw that the little bookstore there was um, going out of business. Well, we didn't know that until we walked in. I thought they had signs. No, they had no signs. We didn't find out until we did. know. All right, well, he knows, I don't remember. Yeah. All right. So we, we, we just thought, oh, you know, I had some store credit. So we thought, oh, let's go across the street. Yes. Uh, shop around while, we're, while we have our ice cream. Yeah. And it was when we were checking out. Oh, that Tim said. Yeah. Like, he's uh like i put on my store credit and he said you, you might want to he saw i had a bunch left and he said you might want to use this up because we're going to be closing in a month at the end of july oh i forgot that and, and there was a pause and then he said unless the owner finds the right buyer and it was like this unless the owner finds the right buyer and then we just we just looked at each other yeah but yeah we, we did. didn't say anything but we got the same thought in our head yeah which we didn't say till we got out of the yeah, shop all so the way to our car. You're not telling it in the cinematic well, way. I, this is the way I usually tell it. All right, you, can well, tell it all right you tell it more than I do. But anyway, so here's what I remember. So then we're walking out of the store and we go up the ramp and we go out the door. This is a Kelsey story, so it takes a long time. I'm so sorry, someone give me a time like this when it's time. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, but we go out and we you know, turn and we're walking down the street. Okay, I'll fast forward. So we're at the corner. This is important. The corner of uh, going towards Caldy's, what was Caldy's, right? And we're going to cross the street and we're holding our little hands together. Ninth and Cherry. Ninth and Cherry. And we're like, and our car's right over there. And I'm like eating my ice cream. I have a spoon. I'm not, a, I'm not a cone licker. I'm a spoon user. I just, let's just be honest. So that should be one of your, your warm up questions. Okay. Focus here. So we like hold hands and there was like a squeeze of the hand and like some sort of magical energy that is happening. And at, literally in the middle of the street, as we're crossing, we were like, should we buy this bookstore? Is that, is that what's happening? And then we both were like, ha, ah. and it truly was like, like, I think when we still tell the story, it feels the same. Like it was a magical, magical feeling. Like the universe seriously looked at us and was like, you dummies, like, why aren't you doing this? This is what you need to do. So Joe was looking for a change and I was fully employed at the university at the time and, and loving my job there. And, and so we kind of were like, okay, so we got to the car and I, with my, you know, handed in a smartphone, I emailed the owner on my phone and was just like, hi, what do you think about this? Ha! Ah. And so she immediately emailed us back. I think we met her the next day or the like, day after yeah, or something. Two days later, maybe. And we just talked about it. And she was like, the only person I could imagine selling this store to is Joe. 
And so in her mind, she had been thinking like the perfect person to buy the store would be Joe, but I don't know if he's interested. So I'm just going to sell it. Like she just kind of hadn't really, you know, put it all together and it just kind of all worked out, you know? So within, I don't know. So was, we ended that was, up, that was like at the very end of June when we walked in Yeah. and we met with Amy like two or three days later, we took a, a few days to think about it and then, yeah. And, and then it was so 30 had, and then it was 30 days until we basically we opened the store so like yeah, we, we didn't officially took over on august 1st right so we did an we did an indiegogo campaign which is like i don't know if there is it's like a kickstarter i don't know if they're still out there doing their thing but um we used them and we we asked for like half of the amount of money that it would be to to buy the shop from her um we got overfunded like people were just whatever like um we got published in all of these trade magazines, like the books, because like our story is cute, given that we met at a bookstore and then we like are crowdsourcing to like open a bookstore, you know I mean? It's just like, you couldn't pick a better marketing story, right? Like it just, but it's all, and it's all true. It's like amazing, but we definitely leaned on that a little heavily to help people, you know, be inspired. But our book community in California, this is another thing about working in the book industry in particular is that you know everybody and you support everybody and like we we don't think of other bookstores like skylark is down the street from us that's great We're, we don't look at them as competition because when you are a book, small business bookstore you are competing against amazon like you're not you're not competing with each other you're trying to keep each other there because the more bookstores that are there the more book people will come and the more stores they'll go to bookstore people don't just visit one bookstore they get they do the they rounds they go to all of them you know like we plan vacations around what bookstores we're going to go visit because we're nerds like that is who we are we're here for and everyone else who wants to come in obviously as well but um so yeah so it was 30 days to open so we gathered our friends we um asked for help with everything so we had a former student did our logo for us we um you know i was like up really late typing all of the things about what we you know what our mission was like our story just getting a website together really quickly pretty much everything you see now is still what i made in like three days or something like it just was like i don't even know if i drank a lot of coffee then i do now but um i think i was just like just full on that magic energy that was like making it all happen yeah it was this amazing creative burst yeah it creative. just we creative exactly uh, we just like made this thing happen and so and our friends like helped us paint the store they helped us redo all the shelter, you know, like they just made us feel like we were so supported in the community that the community wanted us to do this. So, um, so that was really great. And I think that we, that like, that's where the word promise really comes in for me is like, it was like a promise. We made a promise to the people who helped us. We made a promise to the community. We made a promise to the people who funded us, you know, our parents and everybody of like, this is our dream. And we promise to follow this through. Like we will work our hardest to make this happen for you. Um, and we want to be here as a sustainable business. We don't want this to just be like this funny thing that, oh my gosh, look, we opened a business and oh, we're booksellers, oh, like whatever. Like we work really hard at this, again, to provide that space where people can um, make a connection with an author that they didn't know they needed in their life, um, to hear a story or a point of view that they didn't know before for kids to meet each other. We had like a little book club <laughs> for kids for a little while where they would come in and like, we'd read a little story and then they would write something and I tried to get them to write. They just wanted to draw pictures of, you know, creepy things. That was their thing. But, um, but I still talk to some of those kids over Facebook messenger. Like they'll call me and just give me like their book report. And they're like, look, look at this picture and this thing. And, blah, blah, blah. and I'm like, that's great guys. You know, like, so there's that kind of, um, growing the next people, you know, making the next booksellers, hopefully. Um, yeah, the, and parents finding their childhood favorites. Yeah. Like, oh, I love this when I was 10 and then pass it on to their child. Right, exactly. It's really special to see. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I think that we, you know, so I'm an artist and I uh, actually run the Columbia Art League in town. Um, but one of the big things for me is that I wanted to make sure our store feels unique and that we can always be creative and always have this sort of drive by art experience for people. So um there's no corporate rules for us like we don't we don't need to to follow anybody else's like um i don't know we just we just yeah. do what we want which is <laughs> kind of amazing which that i realize that um now now i feel like a lot of people are making their own careers and it's more normalized but again go back to that vision of 
of what you what we saw as a kid of like yeah. the jobs that you could have you know like like my, my dad worked for state farm at the corporate headquarters and it was just massive people in suits and yeah. suitcases and i mean like the huxtables like we're talking about fictional families like the huxtables are you know it's 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 so sad now that i can't still love that family as much but I grew up watching the Cosby show all the time. I mean, that was, they were like the people, that was the family I wanted to be in. And who were their parents? They were a doctor and a lawyer, you know? Like, so that seemed like what the normal thing was. Um, so the fact that I get to completely redo a window every couple of months and like work with local artists to make that window be attention grabbing and, and draw people into the store from outside is like the coolest thing that I could possibly get to do. You know, I think that that's really fun and that Joe gets to, he knows what books to put in our store because he's responding to the community, you know, like he's, he's what people want to read and what they're asking for. He makes sure to have in, but then again, he's choosing those books that he feels like people need to have on their shelf or they need to take a look at, they need to read. So, um, and then this is our, our community promises that we will stick around and we will, <laughs> we will work our hardest to make sure that we're here to help out um and is it possible that i'm doing a conclusion maybe I don't know. it is i don't know maybe yeah. i like but to talk oh back to the promise like we oh, often yeah. have people come in and say thank you for being here yeah this, this is what you do is so important and yeah both for like you know being a space to take books for people who don't need them anymore and to pass those on and recirculate that those stories and that information right um, yeah, I think it's important to say that we we deal in used books, right? So we are buying primarily. primarily. So we're buying books from people, and then we're, um, you know, selling them or whatever. We go to big book sales, and we get to like sort of hunt for the books that we want, which is really fun and kind of romantic feeling. Um, and there's lots of stuff like that that's <clears throat> a little less pressure than if we were running a new bookstore, because then we truly would be competing with Amazon, you know. Um, but I think that we are able to kind of make our space unique and creative and um and filled with all sorts of promise look how she just tied it all together um so we never have to wear formal wear like that is like our goal in life like we both want to just be able to wear whatever we want um and we force our children to visit bookstores whenever we travel i kind of mentioned that before so here are small people <laughs> in many bookstores over the years um and you can follow us and find out more information about us if you don't already. I'm sure a lot of you have come in who are local to the shop. Um, and two more things, just keep reading. You know, listening to books is reading books. I wanna make that totally clear to people, like absolutely listen to your books, buy your books uh, from wherever. Just, just keep reading, that's really important. And support your local independence as much as you can. Obviously we're all gonna shop wherever we need to shop, but. Um, one thing that keeps our community unique and one reason that we can do what we want to do is because we are in a space where people can, um, they can experience a lot of different kinds of businesses, right? Because we're not all just one big box store. So, um, supporting your local is good. Ta-da! Thank you so much, guys. Everyone give them a little bit of a round of applause. Um, I am obsessed with both of you you guys are so great i've been in your shop before but probably not in the last like nine to ten months because which is fine i'm afraid to go anywhere <laughs> yes, no that's totally fine <laughs> uh, but i know so i work um at influence and co here in town and we've done book clubs and we often mm -hmm. kind of buy our books through you too so we can not only be sustainable buying used books, but also just supporting local businesses. So we love what you guys are doing. Um, before I move it over to Sarah for some q and I actually have a question myself. Um, I'm going to figure out the best way to word this. I didn't know how to type it out. But I guess I'm curious about um, what you think bookstores, like what, or maybe even just personally, what you feel like your role as a local businesses or a bookshop is in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, because you mentioned like black authors or Asian authors, you feel like don't get picked up as much. Um, I've also, Columbia is a little liberal blue dot and this like wide array of like red. Um, but I've seen, you know, social justice posters in your windows and like causes that you feel uh, that you support. I guess I'm wondering like where you feel like you all fit because um, oftentimes I hear like, I just want to buy a product. I don't want to hear your political views or like you hearing that. So where do you feel like you fit in or where do you think bookstores or local bookshops like you who are trying to 
encourage reading and um, like spreading your worldview a bit, like what do you feel like your role is in all of that? And um, if that makes any sense, I'm just really yeah. curious about what you guys think. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, 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 we kind of take this idea to some extent from our, from Kepler's, which was the idea that uh, a bookstore is this clearinghouse of ideas and you have to have all kinds of things, even things you don't agree with, um, to kind of see where their perspectives are and what you think of them. And then especially in terms of like promoting voices, I believe in that because, you know, throughout so much of history, it, there's been like the whatever majority of the time was like that's the voice that gets printed and and circulated and we want to get other voices out there and exposed as well and it's it can be hard to do sometimes like at the, at the big book sales like like it's a fairly diverse array of stuff we find but like um but like um fi fiction it's, it's easier to get like the diverse voices but um, some categories it's hard. So like our LGBTQ section, I've had a real hard time building that up. And, and so I just started ordering new titles and marking them down to be closer to a used price. And, and that, yeah. it's, that's been really successful. We sell a lot of those. Yeah. Because um, it's more important for us yeah. to, that, we're, that we're providing that voice and that space for someone to buy that book. Um, and, you know, like so, we had a good section for a while for LGBTQ stuff, but then um, someone wonderfully bought the entire section out and then handed all the books out to the like the at Como the, Pride, Pride, you know, yeah. which is and like and this happened three years cutest. in a row. And we had like nothing left. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so I just yeah sort of primed the pump. Yeah, I mean, I think that you know, so like I'm I'm from the Bay Area, whatever, and um, Kepler's in in 1955 when it was established was like this democratic like clearing house of people like my mom used to be there in high school like typing letters to like the you know for the democratic party like on behalf of them or whatever and, um and our and the person who founded the store was a is a pacifist or was a pacifist and um was all about the nonviolence and anti-war movement and stuff like that in the 50s 60s 70s so we kind of grew up with this uh as our or i grew up at least with that within my background. Um, and one person in particular who was important at Kepler's was named Ira Sandpearl. And he came to my hippie elementary school that I went to um, and talked to us all about, you know, marching with Dr. King and being in jail with him and, um, and what it was like to be on the front lines of a nonviolent movement and what that means. And so I think that, like, I've kind of been steeped in this tradition of of social justice it's not something that i think i chose it's just something that is has been a part of my background and and what i do so um but just like with any white folks i'm trying my best to um you know step back and let other voices be heard and you know if i can i want to help amplify as much as possible um as you know i hear i, I talk a lot too so, <laughs> so but i think that um when i worked at the university i was a part i was like immediately they made me be on the diversity committee and like then I started like being the person who did all the trainings and like made sure that the white people I was working with could be better at being better white people and like working I always worked in the social justice offices and um and that kind of thing so I think that like just my background as a person has made it so that I live my life sort of pushing that agenda in general and so a bookstore is the best place to do that because you can you can easily say here, read this, you know, like, don't listen to me. I, I don't have the experience of this person, but this person can tell you in their own words yeah. what it's like. Like, everyone should read James Baldwin. You know what I mean? Like, this and is something. Toni Morrison. And Toni Morrison. And that's just, the, that's the very, that's the primer, you know, that's like, but then get deeper and go more, you know. So, um, and we'd be happy to put together a list if anybody wants of things that we love and, and have read and stuff. But. Oh, and also with the, the notion of Columbia being sort of this blue dot in the state, like, people come here from other towns, like I, um, from Rolla, from Kirksville, from all over. Yeah, we're like the big, Missouri. we have a mall. Okay, we're yeah. like big business here. So. And, and I, I remember one day we had a group of college students from Rolla come in and they were looking and they said, wow, your religion section has more than one religion. Yeah. And, you know, it wasn't just Christianity. We have books on Judaism, and Islam, and Buddhism, and Taoism, and, um, and comparative religion. Yeah. And, and they were they were pleasantly surprised by this yeah because they wanted to learn more about other religions as well yeah thanks so much for just being honest i was just very curious i just love walking past there and just feeling like it's in your place just feels warm and welcoming to anybody who wants to come in there and i think that's what makes it 
really special. Um, Sarah, I'm going to let you field some other questions. Um, I know you're also a really big fan of Yellow Dog, so I'm excited to have you lead this part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, FYI, I'm like a big fan girl, Kelsey. And Joe. It's been so fun hearing the story behind it because I've, I again, like Lindsay, have been kind of bunkered down. But prior to that, it is my son's favorite little book story. He loves that little nook in the back. We yeah. always find something special in there. So big fans. Um, so I have a question from Lisa. Um, she had asked uh, if the previous store was going out of business when you guys came in and had started talking to them. Was that an indicator that it would not be a successful business for you guys? And how did you guys get over that risk? Um, it's a good question. Yeah, well, we, well, a couple of things. One is that the, the previous owner very graciously showed us like kind of her financial records and, and, and said, you know, that for a couple of years, this, it was going very well. And then there were a couple of reasons they had a downturn. Uh, but she was convinced that it could be successful again. And, and she also like didn't have the time to really put into it to make it work. And with two of us, especially that would make, be better. He's being, then, he's being super nice. I think she was like, did not want to do it anymore basically. And was like, eh, I don't want to yeah. do this. And so she kind of just didn't put the effort into it. And we were like all about effort. Yeah. So. <laughs> and then also we, with, with our experience, because we'd worked for so long in books and I'd been in grad school in literature. So like we have this immense book knowledge that we'd built up and we keep building because you're, I'm learning every day I'm in the shop. I hear about books I've never heard of before yeah. that are now on my radar. Yeah. Um, so we thought between the energy we put in and the, and the background we had that we could make it work anyway. Yeah. Um, although we were, we were a little nervous, you know, yeah, I mean, who knows? It's always a crapshoot, you know, but yeah, you never really know. But I think too, um, because Columbia, so coming from California where things are so expensive and like we can do this work here. And I say work, meaning like not just like owning a bookstore, but also like pushing a social justice agenda and things like that, like because we are here and in California, it seems like people have a, you know, are like more woke or something, which isn't always true, but by the way, but um but we can't afford to do it there. You know what I mean? And it's maybe doesn't need to be done quite the same way. And I feel like here we're able to kind of like, we know we need to work a little harder and that's okay. Like we want to do that here. So, um, so yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, the rent is better here than it would be in California. It a lot. Be, yeah. yeah. Well, we're, we're selfishly happy you're here. So we're, right, glad, yeah. <laughs> that, we're glad that we made that. We're glad that you made the move. Yeah. Um, I had a question come in from Laura. She asked, and this was something I actually was thinking about too when you guys had first started talking. Um, has running a bookstore ever made it feel like reading books just became your job and now is reading less joyful for you all? I know it seems like those nap read trips might be the helpful pinpoint there, but we're curious. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> I think it's more that, well, you can say, but. <laughs> well, for me, I, uh, I have less time to read. <laughs> Yeah, it, it still never feels like a job, like no. the, the reading part. Um, I would, I would like to be reading more than I am, but it's, um, I just don't feel I have as much time. Yeah, and same with me. I, and I also, again, have a, like another full time job, and I always end up creating more jobs for myself because I'm. <laughs> you, yeah, weird, even but... at, at Kepler's, like read, you were expected to read and know about books and at least look through them, and so you could say something about them to recommend to someone. Um, but that was fun. Yeah, I mean, no, it <laughs> doesn't to, feel like a job yeah, at all. I would, I would read. <laughs> that's 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 yeah. like the fun part of the job. I yeah. think is is staying up on what's going on and and reading things that people are talking about. So, mm -hmm. do you guys ever play a game? I I used to work at a a big box bookstore, but I loved books. Like you were saying, most people yeah. that you find yeah. out work. No books shade, books no shade, there. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. You want to be there, but I worked at the Barnes and Noble in town for a few years while I was finishing up school, and I used to love like when people would come up to the info desk and and be like okay, I'm thinking of this book. It's like got a white cover, yep, yep. With like green lettering. And like, it would be the best day in the world. Like when those things could come to you, cause you were just, and you would just have so much excitement. Yep. The people asking would be like, okay. <laughs> I know. This one? Is it, yes. yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Joe actually does this thing where if someone is even in the store, which is like kind of creepy, but I love you, but it's like, it's, it's a very if, small if, store. Okay. But if someone's talking about it at like the window and he's like four feet away at the, the, the desk, Someone will say, you know, what's that book? And blah, 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 to the person they're with. And then he's like, he'll go and find it and go like this one. And then they're like, <laughs> yes. Which mostly people are like, yeah. And some people are like, I was not expecting that. So yeah, but it's also like the recall on where things are in the store is also fun. You know, that kind of thing. So, but yeah. I love that. Um, 
I, I didn't see any other questions come in. Again, you guys, if anyone else has questions, just pop them my way. I'm happy to ask. I have a little, a few questions that I've written down um, while people are still thinking. But um, Kelsey, I actually have a little art piece from, I think you did it. It was like sock monkeys, like oh, three sure. little sock monkeys holding hands. And I've seen a few sock monkey things in your store. And I was just wondering if there's a story behind that, if that's just a little <laughs> character you like to draw. And then a secondary kind of question on top of that is what, for you, like, was it, what kind of inspired you starting to do other things besides just selling the books? Like, cause it, obviously you have a, you have a talent there. Yeah, um, I, yes, yeah, sock, I do love a sock monkey. I don't know, but it's always been a thing that I've liked, um, but I, they're really easy to draw. So this is like maybe where my drawing skill level was at the time. So I have my master's in photography from the Academy of Art in San Francisco. And that's like, so I, I think in photographs more than anything else, kind of in visuals. And I was an art history major for my undergrad. So I think that there's a lot of like visual culture that lives through me. So I, I am constantly thinking of content without ha without that having been a word <laughs> back in the day like oh this is cool this looks good together this would make a nice photograph this will look good on our website you know like those kinds of things were always kind of in my brain so um so i think that your question about oh so yeah i don't know i just wanted i think <laughs> i think that we always fight in our real life about um we always fight at competition about like who has wall space for bookcases or for uh <laughs> art on the wall so yeah. So we're actually at Cal right now because we have better Wi-Fi here. But um, if we were at home, we'd probably be in our library, which is like all bookcases. And then there's like a few spots where I've managed to like eke out some art space. Um, but that's like a constant struggle for us. And that was true at the bookstore too. So when we opened the shop, if you've been in there, you know, it's really, really, really small, you know? So it's like, I thought, oh, we could have art artwork on the, the walls from local artists and we could do all this stuff. And it was just, that just didn't happen because we just don't have the space, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of where the window became the, well, we'll just do it in the window. And then people can have this art experience just as they're even just passing by. They don't even have to interact in a way if they don't want to, but it'll hopefully they'll brighten up or their smile or they'll kind of think about it a little bit as they walk by. So that was kind of where all that sort of started. But um, at Kepler's, I did I did the displays for years, and so that kind of is. Uh, <laughs> I was like, I want to make sure I can still do that stuff. So. Yeah, well, it's so fun, and I and I I'm sure I'm sure everyone can attest to that. You were talking about drive by art. I mean, that's one of the the funnest things to do on Ninth Street is to see see what's in the yellow dog yeah, like yeah, window yeah. display. So um, I have a question from Jessica. She had said, I read somewhere that in low income areas, the ratio is one book for every three hundred kids. Um, so she says she's been trying to find a charity or some kind of group where you can just donate children's books to kids who have none. Do you know of anything like that available? I don't, but we should find out. Yeah. Um, I, can, I can jump in here, Jess. So yeah. if you're, um, I know that Dolly Parton has a nationwide, or of course she does, um, nationwide organization that you can give money to. And she sends books every month to kids in low income areas, like they get a book every month. So it's like a book of the month thing for kids who don't have access to books. So I, I, I don't know the name of that organization offhand, but you could probably Google like Dolly Parton books. Yeah, it's called the Imagination Library, mm -hmm. I think. And um, we were actually one of their pilot cities that they started in. And so both of our kids got signed up for it just because we had babies in Columbia. Mm -hmm. So, and the books are great and they're, they're um, working on being more diverse and they talk about certain issues and stuff so it's actually they're they're like a little bit have like little lessons and stuff in them yeah. but they don't feel yeah. too gross you some, know? Are, some are just great stories or, or some are classics yeah like the or the, the little engine that could the the over in the meadow oh yeah yeah really um, good yeah and, classics and, yeah. and some are like yeah more recent issue driven ones and mm. we uh I think I think having a free library is really good to do if you are in a community or in a neighborhood that um, where you see a lot of kids around hanging out like if and if you you know I think having a little free library is a good thing to put in your yard so if you guys um, have the space or time and the <laughs> inclination to do that I think that that's something that has been really um, helpful and, and they're all over Columbia too but I tend to see that in the more sort of in quotes affluent neighborhoods and so I think that if you are not in that kind of neighborhood, please put one up. I think that that, that people do, you know, do utilize them. So, yeah. 
Thank you. Um, I have another question from Josh. Um, Josh said, what did you learn about running a small bookstore in the age of Amazon that you might not have known prior to taking over Yellow Dog? One is that you don't have to discount the new books. Yeah. Um, like our, our new titles, we, we never discount unless they're, they're dinged or something. Then I'll mark them down a little bit. Um, and people are still willing to buy them. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know if they would. You know, like I, I always kind of wonder how Skylark does it. <laughs> but no, um, then it's, it's just a challenge um, to compete with a company that will discount things 30, 40%. 45 percent 50 percent even yeah which they don't which make any money they're not making money at that point they they're, don't make any money on losing money right um, i mean it's just the it's the first one is free basically yeah. for but, their but own people business who model. really value the book and, and the content will pay a full price for it yeah yeah i mean i would say that i think just how we treat our employees and sort of you know like running a small business is all about keeping your people happy and 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 paid well and and um and you know flexibility and all that stuff and um knowing how like a big box store runs their just how their hr works is like a travesty you know like they don't treat their people well so i think that's part of it too is this running a business where we truly care about our employees and we mm. want them to be happy we don't have that many of them but um but we try to be as like accommodating and work with them as much as possible yeah. and whatever their needs are so yeah. and we've steadily increased our wage as we've been open yeah yeah Oh, that was our door. <laughs> Hang on, what's up? Um, I'm so excited to, hope to have had you all today. Um, uh, thanks to Miranda for working that out to get you guys booked for today. So we loved having you. We'd love if you could join any of our events in the future. We do we typically do third Friday of every month. This month was a little different because we were off a holiday. And yeah. um, so typically third Friday, just keep um, your eyes open for um, the next update on our speaker and theme for next month. That'll all be on social very soon. But again, thanks Lisa from HU for joining us today. It was a pleasure to have you. Um, everyone have a good Friday morning, great weekend, and we'll see you next month. Thanks again. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye.